All right, all right, all right. Welcome back to WMMA Scene Now with your host, Chuck Stevenson, as always. Coming at you with our weekly WMMA Scene Report. Now, normally I do these uh, live, but I want to do uh, combine this with this week's with the Invicta 38 preview. So, decided to record this so I could uh, better edit it. Uh, and that way I can have like the pictures of the fighters up and stuff for the Invicta 38 preview. I'm also trying testing out this new microphone uh, tonight, so we'll see how it goes. Now, it won't be doing a recorded uh, edition every week. We'll be back to the live next week. Um, one thing, if you're just coming in for the Invicta 38 preview, you can go ahead and fast forward through all the other stuff. It's mostly uh, fight results from this past weekend, news, uh, stuff about upcoming fights, stuff like that. So if you're just coming in for the Invicta 38 preview, uh, go ahead and fast forward. I'll try to put, remember to put a timestamp in the description down below. Uh, but first up, we're going to go over this past weekend's uh, fight results. Uh, we had several events this past weekend. First up on Friday was one championship, Dawn of Valor in Jakarta Rea, Indonesia. Uh, at... 115 pounds, or the one atom weight division, as they like to call it. Uh, Priscilla Hurtati Lumbangal defeated Bozena Antoniar via unanimous decision. Uh, Lumbangal climbed to seven and four. Antoniar fell to three and two. Now I haven't rewatched this fight yet, and I could only pay a little bit of attention to it when it was live. But from what I remember, this was kind of a hometown decision. Uh, I thought Antoniar was outboxing uh, Lumbangal. Uh, throughout the fight, uh, Lumban Gal was getting in some nice kicks, and I think she had a little bit of groundwork in her favor. But for what I could see, it was mostly Antonia outboxing her handily. Um, so looked like a hometown decision for Lumban Gal. She's Indonesian. Uh, Antonia is from Myanmar. And some people might say that this was karma because a lot of people felt that Antonia lost her last fight to B. Nguyen, and she got, I believe it was a split decision win. So... It is what it is, you know, as people like to say. Uh, next up, Saturday morning was UFC Fight Night Singapore. Had two fights there. First up at straw weight was uh, Loma Lukbunmi defeated Alexandra Albu via split decision. Lukbunmi climbed to 4-1. and one. Albu climbed to 3-2. and two. So I did a full review on this. If you want, you can go check it out afterwards. Uh, but this was basically Lukbunmi putting on a clinch clinic on Albu. Now, Albu did get in some nice hard shots, particularly between the three and four minute mark of the second round. And she did finish the fight on top. Uh, like the last 30 seconds, she got a nice scissor sweep and it landed some ground pound. But the real story of the fight was the clinch work of Luke Bumi, just totally outclassing Albu. Um, it'll be interesting to see where Luke Bumi goes from here in the UFC strawweight division. She was way outsized by Albu, and Albu is probably one of the least skilled fighters in the division. So it'll be in very, very interesting to see who they match Luke Bumi up with next. Uh, next up was also a strawweight fight. Randa Marcos defeated Ashley Yoder via split decision. Uh, Marcos climbed to 10-7. and seven. Yoder fell to 7-5. and five. The story of this fight uh, was Yoder's wrestling versus the striking of Marcos. Now, I thought this was going to be mostly a wrestling battle, but Yoder whooped uh, Marcos for the most part when it was on the ground, but on the feet was a different story because Marcos landed a lot of nice shots on Yoder standing. Uh, the striking of Marcos paying dividends here, getting the split decision. Marcos has never won nor lost two fights in a row since I believe 2014, uh, pretty much the entire time she's been in the UFC. Uh, coming off a loss to Gedalia, picks up another win, so she still holds her reign as the uh, queen of inconsistency. And Yoder uh, snaps uh, a two fight winning streak there. Also, this weekend was Bellator 231, Mir versus Nelson 2. This was actually Friday night. Um, First up was an atomweight fight. Uh, Elise Reed defeated Rebecca Brigman 
via first round TKO due to punches against the cage. It's four minutes, 48 seconds. Uh, Reed climbed to 0-1. Brigman fell to... Excuse me. Reed climbed to 1-0. Brigman fell to 0-1. Um, I didn't get to see this fight. I did see the ending sequence. And from what I understood, Brigman looked like she had never been in a cage before. Um, I guess she came in without any amateur experience. Uh, oh, she she was 2-1 and one as, an, or excuse me, 2-0 and oh as an, in MMA as an amateur. Um, but from what I've heard, what I've read, Reed looked like she knew what she was doing and Brigman did not. So we'll have to see as far as that goes. Um, Next up was a fight. On, I missed all of these fights, really, unfortunately. Uh, Jesse Miel defeated Toledo Noguera via split decision. Miel climbed to 9-3. and three. Noguera fell to 7-2. and two. That is two losses in a row for Toledo Noguera. Now, I admit I picked Noguera to win this. Uh, I got that one wrong. I'll have to watch, take the time to watch that fight and see what happened there. Um, and then finally, at flyweight, uh, Ilara Joanne had a successful uh, Bellator debut, defeating Beck Rollins in her Bellator debut uh, via knee bar at 3 minutes 35 seconds of the second round. Joanne climbed to 9 and 4. Beck Rollins fell to 7 and 9. I believe this makes uh, five straight losses for Beck Rollins in her return to MMA after three fights at Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. So. Not a good sign for Beck Rawlings. She might want to see if she can return to bare knuckle if they were paying her enough. And if they still want to keep paying her. Um, I'll have to check this fight out and see what Ilara Joanne was doing. Knee bar is a nice submission. Not very common in MMA. And then finally, this past weekend, as soon as it loads, was SFT, or Standout Fighting Tournament 17, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, an all-ladies card that I did not hear about until after it went down. So we'll just go over a quick uh, reading of the results here. Um, at strawweight, uh, Pamela Mera Assis defeated Anna Carolina via third-round KO TKO. Assis climbed to four and two. Carolina fell to three and four. At flyweight, Claudia Leite. Defeated Alessandra Tenara via KO TKO in the first round. Leti climbed to three and one. Tenara fell to four and five. Also at flyweight, Myra Cantueria defeated Fernanda Barbosa via unanimous decision. Cantueria climbing to eight and three. Barbosa falling to four and four. Uh, then the co main event was up at bantamweight. Giselle Mojea. Defeated Diane Firmino uh, via unanimous decision. Mojea climbed to 9-3. and three. Firmino fell to 10-5. and five. And then in the main event at strawweight, Isabella de Padua defeated Rayan Amanda via T KO TKO due to doctor stoppage. Uh, Padua climbed to 5-1. and one. Amanda fell to 5-3. and three. So that was all the results for this past weekend. Uh, so we'll move on to the news. And there was a lot more news uh, just in the last two days than there was in the previous five combined. Uh, first up, UFC strawweight Estella Nunes has accepted a two-year sentence, or sanction rather, for a violation of the UFC anti-doping policy after testing positive for a prohibited substance. Uh, followed, uh, covered this on the channel before. I believe it was an actual anabolic steroid that she tested positive for. I want to say it was uh, not Osterine. Stanozolol. I believe it was Stanozolol that she tested positive for. That's the same thing that Chris Cyborg tested positive for back in the Strike Force days. Um, also, the UFC. Uh, Marina Rodriguez has been confirmed to replace Claudia Gadelia against Cynthia Calvillo. UFC fight night. Uh, Washington, D.C. on 7 December. So I mentioned this last week that they were looking at Marina Rodriguez and it was later confirmed either that evening or the next day. Uh, I think this is a very interesting fight between two of the top contenders at this, uh, or prospects, I should say, at this weight class. Uh, whoever c 
comes out of this, the victor, is definitely showing themselves to be a contender in the class. And top 10 fighter as well. Uh, up next, two-time Olympic gold medalist and undisputed boxing champion Clarissa Shields has hinted via her social media accounts that she is considering a move to MMA sometime in 2020. However, she hasn't confirmed anything. I'll come out right out and say it. I don't think it's going to happen. I think she's just making noise personally. Um, her last boxing fight got canceled due to some shenanigans that went on. Her opponent's trainer got attacked by Shields' own brother backstage, ended up in the hospital twice. Um, so she is just trying to keep her name out there in any positive way whatsoever. I don't think she'll actually make the move to MMA. Uh, she's too big. I mean, she'd have to cut a lot more weight to get down to a decent weight class. I think she fights at like 160. The biggest weight class available would be 155 at PFL. I don't see them paying her for that. And uh, otherwise, the only other decent fight would be Cyborg and Bellator. And Cyborg has trained with her in the past. I don't think they'd want to fight each other. Or Amanda Nunes in the UFC. And that's at 145. That's way lower. Uh, Shields is supposed to be coming down in weight. Her last uh, most recently canceled fight was a down weight class from where she uh, became undisputed at. But I just don't see it happening. I think this is just talk from her. Uh, up next, Deep Jewels announced their 27th event in Osaka, their first time in Osaka uh, on the 22nd of December. Deep Jewels is an all-ladies uh, promotion uh, based out of Japan. Uh, they do have one confirmed fight as of right now, Mizuki Furuse versus, and this is a real name, Panakata Minori. Um, confirmed uh, participants are Akaringo, who headlined two events ago, uh, Mao Ueda, and Bumoka. I didn't get to catch her last name. I forget it. Um, also, Deep, the parent company of Deep Jewels, Deep 93rd Impact will take place on 15th of December with two uh, confirmed fights. At Adam Waite, Hikaru Aono is taking on Shiyu Park. Uh, that is a classic uh, grappler versus striker match. Hikaru Aono is a wrestler. She is built like a wrestler. Um, and she's taking on Shiyu Park, who is primarily a striker, a kickboxer. Uh, she is the training partner of Sahi Ham. And then at microweight, which is 97 pounds, uh, Satoko Shinashi taking on Mizuki Oshiro in what is largely a squash match. I forget how many fights Shinashi has, but it's a lot. And Oshiro is one and one. So giving Shinashi another squash fight, which she seems to not take on any fights that aren't squash fights. So there it is. Uh, back in the UFC news. Duda Santana is out of her bantamweight bout at UFC Paulo, UFC, excuse me, UFC Sao Paulo, November 16th. Replacing her against Tracy Cortez will be Vanessa Milo, who has a record of 10 and 6. I believe Milo is coming off a successful UFC debut. Could be wrong on that. But anyway, Tracy Cortez replaced Leah Letson, and now Letson's original opponent. And Cortez's original opponent, Duda Santana, is now out, being replaced by Vanessa Milo. So this fight right now is a bit of a mess. Uh, still, actually, it should be a more interesting fight, though. Uh, Vanessa Milo is more skilled than Santana. So, uh, Combate Americas has announced two fights for their December 7th pay-per-view, their first ever pay-per-view, out of McAllen, Texas. It is uh, headlined by a fight between Tito Ortiz and Alberto Del Rio. Uh, first up is their inaugural strawweight championship, first women's championship in Combate America's history uh, between Melissa Supermelli Martinez, 5-0, and and Desiree Dirty Des Yanez, 4-1. and and then they're having a catchweight bout between Dolce, Sexy Star, Garcia, uh, one of their pro wrestlers that is si signed with the promotion. She is 1-0, and oh, and she is taking on Marisol Ruelas, at, who is 1-2. Moving along, Japanese uh, 
promotion Pan Craze. 311 on 8th December in Tokyo has made two fights official. Uh, first up is the a 125 pound fight between Maria Suzuki, who is 1 and 3, taking on Nori Date, who is 3 and 3. Um, that's a bit of a throwaway fight there. Uh, should be Suzuki winning it. Nori Date is a team date fighter. I never picked date fighters to win. Uh, but And then. I believe, if not the main event, then probably the co-main event is the 115-pound championship for the strawweight queen of Pancraze, as they like to call their champions. Emi Fujino, 24 and 11, and I think there's a couple draws in there, taking on Hyunji John, 3 and 2. This is the finals of what was a four-woman strawweight tournament to crown the new champion. Uh, the belt was recently held by... Who was it? The name is escaping me at the moment. I'll I'll remember it in a minute. In a minute, though, um, who is now fighting in the UFC? Uh, some unfortunate news per Korean site SportsW.kr. Jeon Kim is out of her fight at UFC Pusan against Sabina Mazo due to a elbow injury. Mazo's status on the card is currently unknown, however. Uh, but back to fight announcements. A featherweight bout between Charlotte McIntyre, making her pro debut, versus Josie Blaber, who is 1-0, has been set for Bellator London. That's November 23rd. So that is all of the news for the past week. Um, normally, this is when we go into the weekly UFC rankings update. I looked it up this morning, or yesterday rather, and uh, no changes since last week, which isn't surprising. There was only two ladies' fights this past weekend, and I don't believe any of those fighters were ranked, so no reason to believe there would be a change. But you just never know with the UFC rankings. I mean, there could be a change in a division rankings where there was no fight. So... No changes this past weekend. That's easy enough. Which moves us along to a little segment I like to call Welcome to the Scene, where we welcome some of the newest uh, named subscribers. Uh, If you have open subscription settings on YouTube, it lets me know who joins when they join. Uh, So this is something I like to do to you know, welcome some of the newest subscribers. So, uh, the first one is was a name in Chinese characters. I don't know. Uh, the Brother Man, Gary Rodriguez, Heng Chang, and Stefan Hanagraf. Hanagraf. Uh, all of you, welcome to the scene, everyone. Uh, so, which brings us along to our upcoming events for this coming weekend. First up, Combate America's number 48. It's going down in Garland, Texas. There is one ladies fight at 130 pounds between Abril and Guiano 2 and 0 taking on Paula Ramirez 1 and 2. I want to say I've watched Ramirez fight before, but I don't remember. I don't know anything about Anguiano, so I'm not going to make a pick on this one. Which takes us to UFC 244 this coming weekend. Uh, Diaz versus Masvidal. Flyweight fight on the prelims. Katlin Chukagian, 12-2, taking on Jennifer Maya, 17-5-1. Uh, going to topology, Chukagian is the slight betting favorite, minus 155 to plus 125 for Maya. Maya is the older fighter, 31 to 30. Uh, Chukagian is going to have a sizable height advantage, 5'9 to 5'4 for Maya. And she's also Chukagian will also have a reach advantage of 2 inches, 66 to 64 for Maya. Um, I think this is an interesting style matchup. Whoever wins this is probably the next title contender. Um, 
blonde fighter Chukagian likes to stay on the outside and strike at range. Maya is a shooter box stylist. She likes to get in close. And I'd say she's also the more well-rounded of the two. Uh, Chukagian is coming off a win over Joanne Calderwood, which is pretty good at flyweight. Had lost had the loss to Jessica I before that. Um, Maya did drop her UFC debut a year ago to Liz Carmouche. Since then, has defeated Alexis Davis and Roxanne Modafferi um, in a rematch that she had won before. So both are sharing that win over Alexis Davis by unanimous decision. I feel like Maya is the more well-rounded fighter. Chukagian is not an easy fighter to deal with, though. She's uh, very rangy. She's hard to get on the inside with those strikes. But I got to go with Maya. She's just more well-rounded. Uh, she's faced more consistent, high-level competition at flyweight. Chukagian did come down from bantamweight. I got to give the edge, though, to the former Invicta champ in Maya. Just being more well-rounded and having more uh, better solutions to dealing with the striking of uh, Chukagian. So that's the upcoming events this weekend besides Invicta, which, hey, brings us into our discuss weekly discussion topic. And this time I'm dedicating it to an entire preview of Invicta FC number 38, which is headlined by uh, two title fights. One of them in strawweight at the co-main event, and then the other at, uh, what do you call it, flyweight. So two title fights for Invicta this coming weekend. And my computer is screwing up right now. Thankfully, it is still recording. I don't know what's going on with it. Hopefully, this is recording okay. So now i got to go off the fights on the iPad, which is a pain in the rear. And now it's opening up stuff I don't remember clicking on. But I might have. All right. So first up, at Invicta FC 38, we have Serena De Jesus taking on Tanisha Tennant. Bantamweight. Uh, they, both fighters are 1-0 and o as professionals. They both have amateur careers before that. Uh, Tenet is the older fighter, 30 years to 27 for De Jesus. Uh, Tenet looks like she's coming down in weight. Fought at 140 pounds her last fight. Uh, they are both the same height, 5 feet 7 inches. Uh, now looking at both of their amateur records. I've never watched these two ladies' fights. So this one is going to be pure guesswork. And just another reminder, do not make bets based on my picks. I make these mostly for fun. Uh, I try to be serious with them, but I don't always have time to do uh, my full due diligence on that. So being having said that, looking up their amateur record, the Jesus has losses, whereas... Uh, Tenant does not. However, those two losses came to fighters with way more experience at the time. Uh, other than that, De Jesus won all of her amateur fights. And she is training out of a very good camp at Syndicate MMA alongside uh, Roxanne Modafferi, Joanne Calderwood, a bunch of good fighters there, a bunch of USC fighters there. So my pick is going to be with Serena De Jesus. Uh, De Jesus is making history. She is the first autistic fighter to get signed with Invicta Fighting Championships. Uh, she's obviously very high functioning. Uh, next up at is this am I seeing this right at featherweight, Shiana Yaya Rincon making her return after having a kid. Taking on Autumn the Natural Norton. Uh, Young and Cohn coming in with a 2 0 record. Norton coming off 0 uh, 1, having dropped a split decision to Aaron Harp two months ago at Invicta, was it 30? 
36 or 37. I think that was 36 two months ago. Uh, looking at the stats, Rincon is older by one year, 26 to 25. They both have the same height. No reach listed for Rincon on topology. Norton's is listed at 67.5. Now Rincon is was a had some nice wins. Uh, at Invicta uh, over Brooksy Bayard and Courtney King. Both of those, however, came two years ago. In that, Since that time, Rincon has had a kid, and she has changed gyms. She used to be with MMA Gold. Uh, now she's somewhere else in California. you got to think that time off and that gym change is going to affect her. We don't know how it's going to affect her. So for that reason, excuse me, I'm going with uh, the natural Autumn Norton to pick up her first win. Uh, up next, Lisa Spangler Verzosa taking on Carrie Kennison at Bantamweight. Uh, Verzosa, formerly known as the Strangler, now known as Battle Angel, I believe she was the Strangler, taking on Scary Carrie Kennison. Uh, Kennison is. 3 and 1, Verzosa 4 and 0. Oh. Kennison coming off her first loss to Stephanie Geltmacher a little over a year ago. That was a bad loss, so I don't blame her for taking that time off. Uh, Spangler coming off her first win of the year, perfect 4 and 0 oh record, uh, coming off a win over Katarina Lenner several months ago. Uh, before that, she was coming off a win a year ago to Shanna Young. Uh, Kennison is the older fighter, 33 to Spangler Verzosa's 24 years. Uh, Kennison has a one-inch height advantage, 5'7 to 5'6. Verzosa's reach is listed at 68 inches, and I don't have one for Kerry Kennison. I like both of these fighters. Uh, I like what I've seen from both of them. However... Verzosa is just a way more well-rounded fighter, and she's younger. She's got that youth and speed on her side. I'm going with the more well-rounded uh, Lisa Battle Angel Spangler Verzosa to defeat Scary Carrie Kennison, uh, which means Kennison will drop two fights in a row, unfortunately. Uh, so next up, we're going to... A rematch from just a few months ago uh, at Flyweight. Shanna, the Shanimal Young, taking on Mayu Mountain Mama Suotama out of Finland. Uh, Shanna Young coming in with a 6-2 and two record. Uh, Suotama coming in 8-4. and four. Now Suotama is coming in off of two straight losses. First up to Lucrezia Ria a year ago, and then the loss to Shanna Young via unanimous decision. That was a single round fight at the uh, Phoenix Series 2 tournament. Uh, Young balancing losses and wins, coming off a loss uh, two months ago to Sarah Alpar at the Contender Series. Came back, picked up the one round win over Suotama at the Phoenix Series 2. And then losing via rear naked choke submission to Miranda Maverick, the eventual tournament winner, that same night. Um, I'm going with Young to win this rematch. Uh, I just felt that she uh, can is is going to be able. To, I, having watched that fight over again, I feel like she can definitely repeat what she did in the first round for two more rounds. Um, And it's funny because, you know, Suotama, she was one of these, she dates back all the way to, uh, you know, the in strike force days and then decided to come back a little over a year ago or almost two years ago. Uh, started off good and now not doing so good. Uh, looking at the stats, Suotama is the older fighter, 33 to 28. Uh, 
Young is the taller fighter, 5'7 to 5'5. However, both have a 65 inch reach. But anyway, as I was saying, I'm going with uh, the Shanimal, Shanna Young to win this. Which I believe that brings us to oh, the feature bout. At strawweight, Mallory Martin take at five, coming in five and two, taking on Cynthia Sin Arcio, five and one. Uh, Martin is the younger fighter. Arcio is coming in the elder by four years, twenty nine to twenty five. Uh, Arcio has a one inch height advantage, five five to five four. Martin's reach is listed as sixty four inches. I don't have one available for Sin RCO. Uh, so Martin is coming off a six, a win over Mikol Desenyi at the Contender Series, a fight that she was really set up to win. Uh, Desenyi hit hard on the feet, but looked fairly lost on the ground. Like uh, before that, she was coming off a win over Ashley Nichols. Was Martin? Now, RCO is coming off a unanimous decision win over Teresa Blass, who was 0-1 at the time. Now, before that, the two fights before that, RCO drew with Loveth Patra Young, who was making her debut. Oh, that that was a split draw. Uh, the fight was stopped due to accidental eye poke. However, the next very next fight for RCO, she took on Young again and lost via rear naked choke. That does not look good when you're taking on a someone who is as relentless as Mallory Martin. Martin, you know, made a, a gave her got a lot of attention with that clip of her ground and pounding a girl in Victor say nothing can save you. Um, I think that was over Ashley Nichols. Yeah, that was Ashley Nichols, I believe, a year year ago. Um, her fight with Desenyi was good, but it was like, wasn't anything special, I thought. But, RCO is going to have a tough time, and I'm going with Mallory Martin on this. Probably via ground and pound or submission. I'll actually make a real pick on that one. Next up, co-main event, and this one is very interesting. Strawweight. Championship. Vacant title. Kanako Murata coming in 10-1. and one. Taking on Emily Gordinha Ducote, eight and five. Now Murata is coming in on a at least a five fight win streak. I believe it was five. I believe it is five fights. One, two, three, four, five, six fight win streak. Excuse me. Uh, her only loss was at strawweight or excuse me flyweight to Rin Nakai, who was way more experienced and a bigger fighter. Um, since then, she has looked mostly unstoppable. Couple decisions, but then four straight uh, submissions, including two Von Flu chokes at Ryzen 12 and 15, and then a rear naked choke most recently at Invicta 35 over Liana Perosin. Ducote is the Bellator veteran, also coming off a successful Invicta win. Um, however, she. Had a, oh, picked up a win over Catherine Paprocki before that. That's a decent win. Uh, Paprocki was way less experienced, but that's still a decent win, though, for Ducote. Before that, she had dropped three straight uh, in Bellator. But those were at flyweight, and honestly, Ducote's real class is at strawweight. Um, as I said before, she's coming off a successful win over Janessa Morandon. A successful debut, rather. Um for Invicta over Janessa Morandon back in August. Uh, first round knockout, four minutes and three seconds. Very nice win for Ducote there. Out of the two, I would say that Ducote is the more well-rounded fighter. Um, Murata, though, man, if she can get you down on the ground, she is just relentless. She goes for the finish. She's very controlling, but she also... Yeah, she goes for the finish, though. Um, looking at the stats, Murata's the older fighter, 26-25. to 25. Uh, 
Ducote is only one inch taller, 5'2 to 5'1. However, she does have a two inch reach advantage of 64 to 62 inches for Murata. I gotta say, I'm going with Murata to win this. And this is nothing against Emily Ducote. It's just, she is definitely, Ducote is definitely better in the stand up than Murata. But I gotta wonder if she can stop the takedown. And if she can't, it's going to be a long night for her. This is a five round fight. If she doesn't get finished on the ground by Murata, then man, it is going to be a very long night for her. If she can't stop that takedown. So I'm going with Kaneko Murata to win. Which brings us to the main event of the evening. Flyweight title fight on the line. Vanessa Porto coming in 21-8. and eight, Defending against Karina Rodriguez 8-3. and three. Rodriguez coming off uh, wins in the flyweight mini tournament. Which crowned her the number one contender. She had defeated uh, Milana Dudieva via split decision and then captured a unanimous decision over Deanna Bennett, uh, avenging her loss to Bennett last year. Porto's coming in on three straight wins uh, over Milana Dudieva herself via TKO KO, uh, a submission, rear naked choke submission over Mariana Marias. And a technical decision win over Pearl Gonzalez. Uh, Gonzalez uh, poked, if I remember correctly, and it cut, uh, it split Porto's eyelid. But Porto was ahead on the card, so she got the win. Uh, looking at the stats of these two, both of them are probably entering the e or in the end of their prime. So it's do or die for both of these ladies. Uh, Porto is 35 years old. Rodriguez is 34. Uh, I always forget that Rodriguez is like the elder statesman, kind of, of the Lobo girls. Um, Rodriguez will have a 4-inch height advantage, 5 feet 7 or 170 centimeters, to Porto's 5 foot 3 inches or 160 centimeters. She'll also have... A, Rodriguez will also have a 2-inch reach advantage, 67 inches or 170 centimeters, compared to Porto's 65 inches or 165 centimeters. Uh, looking at these two, Rodriguez has very, very crisp boxing. Coming out of the Lobo gym, it's like a boxing gym turned into an MMA gym, basically. Uh... Their head coach, head striking coach, is a pro boxer or a former pro boxer. Um, I believe it's Francisco Grasso, uh, Alexa Grasso's uncle. Uh, Rodriguez does have a lot of good training partners there. Like I said, Alexa Grasso, uh, Rene Aldana, Paulina Vargas, a whole bunch of ladies. I'm not as familiar with uh, Porto's team. According to Tapology, it's Drenix Iglesia team. I'm not sure how accurate that is. Um, I would say Porto is the more well-rounded fighter. Definitely the way more experienced fighter. 29 fights to 11 fights for Rodriguez. Um, and Porto definitely has wins by a greater variety. Um, looking at the percentages here. Uh, 11 submission wins, 4 wins by KO, TKO, 6 by decision, compared to, you look up Rodriguez, the 8 wins, 3 losses, uh, her wins, 3 TKO, 1 submission, 4 decisions. So, more of a decision machine is uh, Rodriguez. Uh, based on that well-roundedness, I got to go with Vanessa Porto. Now, I normally back the Lobo Gym Fighters a lot. Uh, I am a fan of Rodriguez, so there's that disclaimer there. However, I got to set that aside, and I got to go with my gut, which my gut says Vanessa Porto is going to come away 
uh, with this win and retain the flyweight championship of Invicta FC. Um, all right, so that is it for my preview of Invicta FC, and that is it for episode number, I believe it's 42 or 43, 43 of the WMMA Scene Report. So, long video, I know. Um, sorry about that, but it's to me, it's worth it. Um, I do plan on doing a fight companion for Invicta Friday night, so keep an eye out for that. That is tentative, excuse me, tentatively scheduled, um, but not certain yet. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. May or may not do it. Most likely going to. I want to just spent the money on this microphone. I want to get it used. So uh, keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thumbs up are always appreciated. And hey, what are you waiting for? Subscribe to WMAC Now, the best, fastest growing women's mixed martial arts dedicated platform on YouTube. And don't forget to hit that bell for notifications so you know what's going on. And uh, we'll see you next time.